That was uh, way too kind. Uh, I just, one of my colleagues from Tanium pointed out that the uh, date on the slides is wrong. That's actually April Fool's, so maybe this is a, maybe this is a gag against you guys, I don't know. Uh, so this is seeing red improving uh, blue teams through red teaming. This is a slide I showed here a couple of years ago when I was here talking about Kanza. <clears throat> this is the first persistence mechanism uh, I ever found at Microsoft during a red team, blue team engagement. What we did was we ran list DLLs across uh, several thousand machines in a particular online service environment at Microsoft. Uh, we took the data from list DLLs. If you haven't run it, you get the process name and all of the DLLs that are loaded in that process. We aggregated based on the process name. So in this case, you're looking at data for spoolsv.exe. So we took all that data from thousands of machines, aggregated it, and started looking through it, looking for interesting things. About halfway down, you can see this black line that sticks out like a sore thumb. That is, uh, for us, luckily, a long-named DLL that the red team had injected into a spools v process on one machine. That was their persistence mechanism in this particular environment. We showed this slide to them, to the red team, during a post-mortem uh, meeting. And uh, they looked at it and said, you know, face palm moment, we've got to change our tactics and make it harder for them to find us in the future. And it was never this easy again, unfortunately. Uh, so that the red team playing off the blue team, the red team improving because of things the blue team does, and the blue team having to improve because of things the red team does, is largely what this talk is going to be about. Uh, so Rob already gave an intro, so now I regret you know, dedicating 15 slides to intro, so let me get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, I've been doing information security work for uh, a little over 10 years. Most of that time has been focused on incident response and forensics. I've been doing IT-related work for over 20 years now, which is scary. Uh, I was working in a higher education institution during this time, and that was uh, not fun. No firewalls, every machine on the network was an IPv4 address, routable, no NAT, uh, no patch requirements, no update, you know, uh, it, it was just awful. Uh, so in response to that, I worked on a team that tried to build a network access control solution uh, because university too cheap to buy one, so we, we built our own. And during the process of building our own, we discovered that we could use uh, DHCP option requests. You know, DHCP client comes on the network. It asks for things from the DHCP server. We figured out that, hey, every operating system asks for different things. They ask for it in a different order. We can use this to remotely and passively fingerprint OSs. And that sort of started me down the path to uh, getting into the weird machines. Uh, we didn't really think this was all that novel. Our patent attorneys at the university agreed with us, so we didn't pursue patent protection and uh, InfoBlox uh, applied for a patent on basically the same technique uh, a couple years later and it was eventually awarded. Uh, like Rob said, I was a SANS instructor for a few years. I managed uh, and was one of the leading contributors to the digital forensics blog, uh, the award-winning digital forensics blog, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I've written a number of open source tools for DFER and uh, most recently before coming to Tanium, I was the technical lead for security incident response in Office 365. Uh, very large distributed environment, uh, so definitely familiar with the challenges of that. While I was there, I wrote this tool called Kanza that I talked about here a couple of years ago, uh, PowerShell framework for doing incident response, and today I'm at Tanium. Uh, so that's a, a digression, that's my background. This is really why we're here. We're here to talk about uh, why you should be doing red teaming, what red teaming is, how I define it, uh, some highlights and lessons learned from my experience of doing this over four years at Microsoft, who I think should be doing it and when, and some practicalities of red teaming, and finally we'll wrap it all up in a nice uh, conclusion. So just out of curiosity, a uh, show of hands, how many in here are doing red team engagements? How many in here think they're doing red team engagements and they're not sure? How many are doing penetration tests in your organization? Wow, I'm surprised at the number of hands. Uh, okay, so why red teaming? Uh, because it delivers a security incident. If you don't know the difference between red teaming and penetration testing, I'll, I'll get to that as we go here. Red teaming, in my mind, what, differentiate it, what differentiates it from pen testing is that it delivers a security incident. Uh, contrast this with pen testing, which delivers a nice bound report, uh, or, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times it just delivers a report. It's not even that nice of a report. Why should you be red teaming? 
uh, because you will play like you practice. Like coaches like to say this to their sports teams all the time. Uh, so to, to drive this point home a little bit, uh, I've got this little clip here from last year's national championship game. Oh, there's audio. So that's a, a beautiful moment. You know, 4.7 seconds left in the game. It's tied at 74. Uh, Chris Jenkins inbounds the ball to Ryan Archie Diacono, or Diacono, I, I can't say the name. Uh, he passes the ball back. Chris Jenkins takes the shot from the top of the key. Uh, you know, I'm not just showing you this because I love seeing North Carolina lose basketball games. <laughs> Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Uh, I'm showing this because I found, you know, after the game, and I was looking for some examples of, you know, playing how you practice. Uh, this Villanova clip seemed good. They run this play at the end of every practice. So can you imagine, you know, practice starts in like November, uh, the, the season runs through April. At the end of every single practice, these guys run through this drill. They do this when they're exhausted and ready to go focus on something else, go take a shower, go get dinner, what have you. Uh, so their coach does this because he knows that they're gonna play like they practice, especially under stressful situations. And it's the same for your organizations. Doing red team drills gives you a chance to practice security incident response uh, under somewhat realistic uh, circumstances. So that's a little bit about why red teaming, why it's important. So what is it exactly? There, there's uh, some different opinions about what it is. So I, I kind of like to define it in terms of maybe what it isn't or what its constituent parts are. Uh, so red teaming is not threat modeling. Threat modeling is that process that organizations go through they try and enumerate what they think all the threats are to their organization or to some software package they're building, and they talk about how they'll mitigate those threats. Red teaming may include threat modeling, but it's not limited to that. It's not a vulnerability assessment. You know, you can run Nessus in your enterprise, find out what all your vulnerabilities are, build out a nice project plan for how you're gonna go patch all those things. It may include that, but it's not limited to that. It's not penetration testing. I worked in a big tier two regional bank, and we hired, you know, big four letter consulting firms to come in and do uh, pen tests for us and they delivered those nice bound reports. And they would tell us up front, we're gonna start the pen test on this date, we're gonna end it on this date, this is our IP ranges that we're coming from, these are our browser user agent strings, you know, don't shun us, set exceptions in the firewall, don't respond to us. That's penetration testing in a nutshell. Red teams are different. They might tell you when they're starting, they might give you some of that information, but they expect you to respond. They expect you to try and combat them like you would a real adversary. So red teaming is different. Uh, remember this great picture. Uh, that's what pen testing can be thought of. Uh, red teaming is gonna be something that has a mission objective. Some people say you know, the enterprise uh, or domain admin might be the mission objective. That's usually a means to an end. Usually they're gonna be trying to do something like customer pivot. Uh, in the online services world where I worked, a customer pivot would be you know, customer A being able to access customer B's data without authorization. So, you know, imagine uh, that makes sense for Azure, AWS, GitHub, if you're running some online service, that's a customer pivot. IP theft, don't have to explain that one. That could be a mission objective. Burn it all down. Uh, let's see if you can get malware or something like it executing across every machine in the environment. Uh, burn it all down. So Saudi Aramco style, Sony Pictures style attack. The ultimate goal is obviously to test uh, the incident response capabilities and procedures, not just of the defenders, not just of the blue team. If you have a real security incident, you're gonna have legal, communications, management, subject matter experts, developers, network architects, people whose primary job is not security. They're all gonna be involved in the incident response process. So red teaming gives you a chance to test those uh, lines of communication and cooperation and collaboration between those different teams. So that's how I define red teaming, what it is. Uh, so some highlights and lessons learned. I'll share just a few highlights. Uh, I had to strip a lot of them out to, to make the content uh, fit the time. Uh, also share some lessons learned. I'll be sprinkling the lessons learned throughout the remainder of the talk. Uh, so one lesson I learned in doing incident response at Office 365, in smaller environments, uh, this outliers maybe leads thing works really well. In really large scale environments, Despite what Dan Gear says, you know, if you're familiar with Dan Gear, he wrote this paper years ago about the, the dangers of monoculture. You know, if everybody goes to the same operating system, it makes your environment more susceptible to being completely owned. In very large environments, the monoculture is a myth, in my experience. 
uh, you're going to have a very long tail of completely benign outliers in your environment. And unfortunately, your team has to rat hole on every single one of them if you want to do a thorough job to figure out, are these things malicious or are they benign? I would just like once uh, to go into an enterprise where the mythical monoculture really exists and the outliers are actually all malicious. Uh, that would be nice. I don't think Dan Gear ever did incident response work. Uh, the opposite of this is also true. So imagine the Saudi Aramco style event uh, or the Sony Pictures style event where you're just looking at the anomalies when there's malware planted on every single machine that's going to go wipe all the hard drives when they flip the switch. Uh, so outliers may be leads uh, or they may not. Automate whatever you can. This should go without saying. Uh, by example, I worked a, an incident uh, at Microsoft, a red team engagement, where I spent like six hours massaging one day's worth of data looking for uh, red team activity. I was faced with the prospect of doing this again and again and again uh, for the course of the investigation. So that night I went home and I spent like 45 minutes writing a script. I ran that script against that data set. I got the exact same results back in less than a second. So automate whatever you can. It's going to help you out uh, in your engagements. Remediation. This is, should be the ultimate goal of any blue team, is to get to remediation. This is another slide I showed here when I was talking about Kanza a couple of years ago. It's my favorite uh, slide from my time at Microsoft. What this is, is is the console that the red team in Office 365 used to control their botnet. Uh, so they would compromise machines in O365 and make them call home to their command and control in Azure. And this was their interface for controlling those machines. Uh, at the top here, the details are not important. Each one of these lines in the top section are machines that are calling home to the O365 red team. The machines, or the lines that show up in this burnt orange color uh, are machines that we remediated. We kicked off a script via Kanza. It ran over uh, Windows Remote Management and PowerShell and went and cleaned up and kicked them out of the environment. You'll note there's one machine here in gray the Windows Remote Management stack on this particular machine was hosed and we couldn't communicate with it. Uh, so we had to use some other means to try and remediate that particular machine. Uh, which leads to another lesson learned and all incident responders should know this. Incident response like security is a process, not a destination. Uh, so you've got to lather, rinse and repeat or investigate, remediate and repeat. Uh, so those are a few highlights. I'll share some more lessons learned as we go. Who do I think should be red teaming? In my mind, any organization that can have a security incident should probably be, be doing red team activities. Uh, any organization with something worth protecting, but there are some caveats. If you don't have monitoring, if you don't have defensive capabilities, if you don't have IR capabilities, go work on those things first. Don't start red teaming. You'll be in for a very, very bad time. Uh, once you have these things in place, you'll just be in for a bad time. Uh, but make sure you get these things uh, in place first. Don't wait for them to be good or even, you know, especially don't wait for them to be perfect, uh, but don't even have to wait for them to be good. Uh, when your red team comes in, if they're a good team, uh, they'll be able to help you identify that, hey, you've made the wrong investments in monitoring uh, or, or your defensive capabilities that you uh, spent time and effort on are not what uh, you thought they were. So they can help you identify and strategize about what you should be doing. Uh, so who should be doing the red teaming? Uh, uh, Probably an internal team. At Microsoft, we had a dedicated team for this, uh, but not just the security team. The red team can't know everything. They're going to need to bring in subject matter experts uh, to help them understand details about the environments they're trying to, to attack. You're going to find, though, uh, as you do incidents, that documentation is wrong, your, your architecture diagrams are going to be wrong, comments in the code are going to be wrong, the code will get updated and the comments won't. People are going to tell you things that they're wrong about, you know, oh, this section of the network is not actually reachable from the internet, or this system management portal requires two-factor authentication, and there's always going to be exceptions that they forgot about or they don't know about, uh, so always question the assumptions uh, when you're having to deal with real adversaries or red team engagements. When should you be doing red teaming? Um, I originally said as often as you can, and I've, I've since recanted. I think I look back on my time in 0365 a little more fondly than uh, maybe it was when I was really there. Uh, I think probably three times a year for most organizations, depending on your maturity level, is plenty. The reason you don't want to do it more often than that is because uh, you're going to find a lot of things your team needs to work on and fix, and you need time to fix those things. In 0365, the strategy was we're just going to constantly red team the environment. It's going to be great. And it was great for the red team. Uh, not so great for the blue team. It can, you know, doing it more often can be demoralizing. 
uh, and lead to burnout. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get cute with your incidents. I had a friend who worked at a big social network in Silicon Valley, and, and they started doing red team exercises, and they thought, uh, oh, let's do a Valentine's Day themed uh, red team engagement. So they kicked off an engagement on Valentine's Day. The blue team didn't know it was a red team engagement. A lot of the blue team guys, you know, they're well-paid Silicon Valley employees. They had made reservations that really hard to get into restaurants in San Francisco, and they had to cancel their reservations uh, because they had to stay and work a red team engagement. So don't, don't do stuff like that. You know, keep it professional. Uh, avoid concurrent red team incidents. I think at one point in time, uh, John's here, I think. I, I think I saw John here. Did we have three or four concurrent red team engagements running once? I wanted to say it was three and it felt like four, but I think you're probably right. Avoid concurrent red team engagements. It's awful. Uh, you, your team is going to have real incidents that they should be working on, so having multiple red team engagements to work on simultaneously is terrible, uh, so don't do that. Uh, some practicalities uh, of red teaming. You want to have rules of engagement subject to annual review by legal, by the blue team, by the stakeholders that are going to be targeted by the exercises. Uh, you need to get approval from management and legal. Your red team, once your blue team starts getting good and your defenses start getting good, your red team is going to want to do things like, let's install key loggers in the environment, or let's start reading employee email. Uh, and you definitely want legal on the hook for that. You know, our red team started doing things like, let's search email archives for password or usernames, and we'll pull those out of emails because you know, people get lazy and they send that stuff around through email. Uh, so you, you want to have legal engaged uh, in this process. No accessing or tampering with customer data should also be in your rules of engagement. Uh, at least no accessing or tampering with real customer data. If you're an online service, your red team is going to set up bogus accounts uh, and they're going to you know, see if they can exfiltrate data from one to the other. No outages, so no denial of service attacks. Those were off the table for us. No weakening of the company's security posture. That, that should probably be in your rules of engagement. Uh, give the red team access. Don't make the red team prove that your organization is just like every organization in the world. Uh, because you probably are, you can get fished. You know, if you, if you want to prove that you can uh, get fished, have the red team do a fishing exercise once or twice a year, uh, but you can get fixed, fished. What we did at Microsoft was the red team had corporate access. They had access to the corporate network. And from there, they had to see, can I get into a data center? Uh, so just give the red team access. Don't make them prove that you're susceptible to phishing because you are. Give the red team source code. Give them whatever they want. Give them the network architecture diagrams. You're going to find out that stuff's wrong anyway. Keep the blue team in the dark, or at least in uh, poorly lit offices. Uh, real, team, uh, real incidents should trump red team incidents. Should go without saying. If a real incident pops up during the middle of a red team engagement, the red team engagement gets put on hold until the real incident is taken care of. Red incidents are core hours only. Now, some of you are probably saying, how do you ensure that they're core hours only? If a red team member trips over some monitor on the weekend, uh, and the blue team gets called in, how do you know that that's, you know, that's outside core hours if the blue team is responding to it? Red teamers are lazy. They, they want to write tools once and use them in every engagement. Uh, so that was the way it was at Office 365. I'm sure it's going to be that way in other organizations as well. We got really good at being able to, you know, see some process that was doing something malicious, uh, dump the process memory and start going through it and find the signs that it was red team uh, activity uh, because they leave nice indicators or markers. Uh, so we got to attribution very quickly. Uh, so I would say red team incidents, core hours only, plus a little. We Sometimes they would trip over things Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock and we would be there until 7. Uh, but uh, it was didn't happen all that often. So practice how you want to play. And by this I mean you're going to need cross-team collaboration. You want uh, comms involved, subject matter experts, developers, networking teams, people outside of just the, the core security incident response skill set. Uh, because you want to test how would we do this during a real engagement. It's important that you, you know how these things are going to work during a real engagement. Uh, establish a situation room. Designate, uh, or at least a phone bridge. Designate incident and investigative leads, just like you would for a real incident. Your incident lead is going to be the interface to management and people outside the core investigative team. The investigative lead is going to delegate and PM all the activities for the investigation, and then you just run this like you would any IR. So as investigate, document your findings, report your findings. Nobody likes report writing, right? So uh, I like to say analyze for show, report for dough. 
Plan for remediation. All the while you're running your investigation, you should be planning for remediation. How are we going to clean this thing up? That should always be in the back of your mind. Develop that plan. Execute the remediation plan. Go into post-remediation monitoring. Look for anything you may have missed. Look for any new indicators, any new activity uh, related to that team. And when you feel like you've got it all or you're just ready to give up, you move into the post-mortem phase. This is the most important phase of the entire process. You get the stakeholders, the blue team and the red team in a room, and you talk about uh, what happened. It's not about assigning blame. People are going to be to blame, for sure. Uh, but do hold yourself accountable. If you screw something up, and I screwed up stuff all the time, I would miss things that were obvious, uh, hold yourself accountable and have a plan for how are we going to fix this next time? How are we going to do better uh, next time? I like for the blue team to go first during the readout. They give the fictional account of what happened. Uh, all cards on the table. You know, I showed that slide with the DLL and they never did that again. They switched to reflective DLL injection. We never saw them write anything to disk again, except for one regression uh, in one engagement. So it was very tempting when they changed their tactics and made it more difficult for us. You know, I wanted to keep the cards close to my vest, uh, but it's, it's about improving the organization and the capabilities all up. So put it all out on the table, give them your best investigative techniques so that they can improve and make you better. The red team goes second. They tell the factual account of what happened. The blue team tells the fictional account of what they think happened. The difference between the facts and the fiction is the gap where you need to uh, take bugs and feature requests and go improve your processes. Your stakeholders are going to have bugs and feature requests. There's going to be misconfigurations they've got to go fix. There's going to be zero day vulnerabilities they've got to go take care of if you're a development shop. Uh, so some final lessons learned. Some of these are obvious. No, no one should run as admin. This is something that Microsoft still has to learn. Uh, no one should run as admin. What do you do instead? We set up this thing called just-in-time admin, where if somebody needed to get into Office 365 and manage a mailbox server or do something on a domain controller, they had to go through a web form and apply for the level of access they wanted. A just-in-time admin account was created for them with a machine-generated password. Their manager had to approve it, and that account was good for four to eight hours. They had enough time to get the job done, and then if they didn't finish the task, uh, you know, the account expired, sorry. Uh, this made doing IR kind of a nightmare because we had to go through the same process to do IR and that was one aspect of just-in-time that I hated. Uh, you do have to give the IR team the same level of access as the adversary. Segment the network, it goes without saying. Segment the accounts, this goes back to the JIT thing. Uh, use dedicated admin workstations. We tried this in Office 365 a couple of different times. I don't know how it ended up the second time, but the idea was if you need to get into a data center to do work, you do this from a machine that can't access the internet, that you can't read email from. Um, operators weren't huge on it. Get away from human-generated passwords. Humans are a terrible source of entropy. Two-factor authentication everywhere. And then you've got to go verify these things a couple of times a year at least. Do we really have two-factor authentication everywhere? Do we have service accounts that can get into the environment without two-factor authentication? Because the red team will find all of that stuff and make your lives miserable. Uh, so finally, in conclusion, red teaming is hard, uh, but I think it's worth doing. Real incidents may be harder. Uh, when you do red team incidents, you get to do this practice how you want to play, uh, and that's it for me. Any questions about uh, this topic? Um, do you feel that you always need to involve, let's say, uh, non-core IT, like comms, uh, IT ops, management, so in your exercises? Or? You, I, I don't think you always need to. Uh, initially, so we kind of made this up as we went along in Office 365. And you know, people have real jobs to do. And, and for them to drop the ball on their real work and focus on this kind of thing is, is kind of tedious and they don't like doing it. Um, we would at least do like a regular sync. You know, we would send out a communication email once a day or have a, a one hour call uh, every few days with them to catch them up to date. Uh, but you're right, uh, having those teams involved to the same level that the incident response team is involved is not practical. Yep. Yeah, I had a question in the beginning when you start your red team collaboration and blue team collaboration. Um, how, what kind of things do you target based on knowing what the blue team's capabilities are? And <laughs> so then, so and initially, then, you know, red team didn't know what the blue team's capabilities were. And the blue team had no idea of red team capabilities. So initially it was kind of an open an open book uh, where anything was, was on the table. Uh, red team exercises in Office 365 were focused on the service. So there's a lot of different services that make up Office 365, right? There's you know, Exchange Online, SharePoint Online. So they would pick a particular service 
And even within those major branches of the service, there are, are subsets of the service that they could target specifically. Uh, and we generally had a heads up that they were going to be targeting you know, something in Exchange or something in SharePoint. We had, it was open-ended as to when they were going to start and when it was going to end. Uh, but in terms of you know, trying to prove out specific blue team capabilities, can you recover malware, can you do attribution, we never got to that level. Uh, for us, it was let's we'll do whatever we can, you know, try and treat it like a real incident and, and do whatever we can. Any other questions? So, speaking as a blue teamer, uh, I've I've made requests of our red team because I'm specifically interested in in what certain tools look like when they use them, so you know we can so we can see them used in controlled circumstances, so we'd be able to detect them. The response of the red team is, "Oh, we'd like to actually use that tool one of these days, so we decline." <laughs> is there, is there, do you have, you have uh, go, suggestions? Go for set up your own that? lab and go use it. See what forensic artifacts it leaves behind. Uh, the red team in Office 365 got to the point where, uh, for some other security initiatives like monitoring, uh, where every action they took was logged uh, and went into a log file, and they could provide that to the monitoring team after the fact. And the monitoring team could go through that log file and they could start building detections for specific kinds of things like mini cats running in memory or you know other activity like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in that case, I would just say, if you're curious to know what a tool looks like, set up some virtual machines and go run it and, and do the forensic analysis. Uh, I wouldn't wait for the cooperation from the red team on that one. I mean, Dave, I really want to ask you what the hell happened to the Jayhawks this year, but um, <laughs> instead, I'll ask- Are you a Tar Heel fan? When, when you don't have, no, I'm not. Uh, um, at O365, you guys had dedicated red teams and blue teams. What about an organization that has far fewer resources? Is it ever a good idea to do part-time red teaming, or would you better be better advised to hire in an outside consultant? I mean, I, I like the model at O365, which obviously not every organization can do, uh, because the internal team is going to know things better than an external team. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you can hire a good external red team, That'd be good. I would imagine it's going to be more expensive. It's going to take them time to ramp up on the details of the environment and, and get savvy about how they could attack things. So. How do you uh, talk down your red team from just refusing to talk about their tools and techniques because they want an easy card, an easy pass the next way through? How do you, how do you force them to actually play right? So that was something we struggled with. Um, my boss used to say that they were acting like space aliens, you know, because they were the ones who, like, invoke Mimi Cats, the PowerShell uh, uh, injected DLL thing. That whole thing came out of the O365 Red Team. You can thank uh, Office 365 for that if you're having to deal with it in your networks. Um, and so we used to ask them, like, can you just drop files on disk, you know, give us something to go on, because that makes it super, super difficult, especially at a large scale environment. Um, and I, eventually, after after seeing the blue team be you know demoralized for things like that, they they come around. Um, but you know you need to be able to model different adversaries. I would say you know not every set, not every adversary is doing super advanced stuff because they don't necessarily have to. So I I would challenge them in that regard. You know let's play different levels of adversary. Last question. Actually, not a question, but I just gonna. Uh, off of that question, um, one of the things we tried was we have a management group that's red team, experience and blue team both, and they kind of tabletop how the game's going to be played, yep. and then they bring in the red team, blue team after the engagement, and, and they kind of drive what's going to be done. So that helped us out a lot. Yeah, we did tabletop exercises too, as a I think it was FedRAMP requirement or something of that nature. So that was separate from our red team activities, but also useful. So, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.